Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. I'm Tina Huang, and I'm the Policy Program Manager at the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. On behalf of Stanford High, I'm pleased to welcome our partner institutes for this event, the Center for Data Innovation and Seed AI. We're happy to bring to you this webinar called Creating a National AI Research Resource. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Austin Carson. Austin is the founder and president of Seed AI, a nonprofit established to work with a, a diverse group of policymakers, academics, and private sector experts to help communities across the United States access the resources they need to engage with AI. Previously, Austin established and led the DC government affairs operation for NVIDIA, translating NVIDIA's expertise on AI and high performance computing for policymakers. Prior to NVIDIA, Austin held a number of public sector and NGO positions, including serving as legislative director for Chairman Michael McCall and executive director for the Technology Freedom Institute. Austin co-founded the Congressional Tech Staff Association, co-led the Congressional Cybersecurity Caucus and the Congressional High Tech Caucus, and is a founding fellow of the Internet Law and Policy Foundry. Austin, over to you. Thanks, Tina. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for joining me uh, for joining me today. We've got a really killer panel. Um, Pavan and Russ are some of my favorite people to work with on artificial intelligence policy, smarter than me in almost every way. Um, and you're lucky to hear from them today, as always. Um, I want to kick this off just with a little bit of table setting. Um, the National AI Research Resource and similar efforts to develop the tools and expertise and aggregate the data for people across the country to develop artificial intelligence to study it, to test it, uh, I think is one of the most important tasks of you know, the short period of time here and probably going into the future, which is why I left one of the highest growing, fastest growing companies uh, in the modern era to go ahead and jump out here and do this. Um, but you know, as you can see from a couple of things I'm about to share, you know, having these resources and having the expertise to use them is one of the most important factors of developing artificial intelligence. Now, Jack Clark, who's one of my favorite people who I unabashedly am too fond of, um, puts out one of the best newsletters for you to learn about the state of AI research and what's going on. Uh, and a couple of things today, I think, really prove this point. And if you look at it, right, Facebook just launched the most powerful AI supercomputer in the world. Um, and at the same time, they just released language models that are trained on billions and billions of pieces of information so that they can read more languages so it can interact with more people, right? Now, on one hand, that is transparently positive and that we're gonna have artificial intelligence that is no longer just Anglo and English centric, right? On the other hand, it shows you that, why is it Facebook doing this, right? Like I like that Facebook is doing this. I think it's a positive thing overall, but why is it that Facebook is the only entity that can buy this computer, that can do this research, and so people come to it? Another one that popped on his most recent newsletter is Twitter's algorithmic bias bounty. And if you're familiar with bug bounties from you know, the, all the different InfoSec issues that we have and different companies running them, this is a natural evolution of it. And so they make this statement, the challenge showed Twitter that we can't solve these challenges alone. And our understanding of bias in AI can be improved when diverse voices are able to contribute to the conversation. Again, it's fantastic that Twitter is doing this. However, it should not be that we address algorithmic bias through primarily large social media companies' efforts to address it on their own platforms. So, you know, talking about national AI research resources and talking about on a bigger picture of building kind of these resources around the country beyond just research, but into the broader application and testing space um, is pretty much a, a prerogative, like a key prerogative as far as I'm as far as I'm concerned at Stanford, you know, again, a leader in this space has recently uh, acquired the capabilities to release GPT-2 effectively, which is a last generation version of GPT-3, which was one of the most prominent, well-documented large language models, which again, Stanford is referred to as foundation models, um, because they're gonna underpin a lot of the artificial intelligence and next generation computing that we, that we develop. Now, GPT-3, which was the cutting edge, has just been replaced with a new model by OpenAI called Instruct, and they construct GPT, Instruct GPT. Um, so now it's not just one generation behind with one of the best resourced academic institutions in the country, it's two. Right now, I don't, I don't know how much Stanford appreciates being said that they're two generations behind, but it's not them, it's everybody. If Stanford has this issue, just imagine where every other university and every other community in the country um, is on this and how it feels to know that your ability to impact and create things 
is minimal, right? So, you know, we have a couple of different things going on here to address this issue. And the National AI Research Resource is a key one. Stanford has put out a great report on how to set a national research cloud, um, which is a component of a larger AI research resource. And one last point before I kick it over to the other panelists and introduce themselves is uh, recently Senator Portman, Senator Heinrich, Congressman Gonzalez, and Congressman Eshu put out a letter to the director of NSF and the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy pointing out that, you know, one key fact about the, about the relationship between NAIR and the National Research Cloud is that, you know, in the view of the authorizers, the, the NAIR National AI Research Resource will be, as they say, even though it's a mouthful, a heterogeneous system of systems, including a number of test beds, which means that you're going to have systems built at universities around the country. You're going to have communities that are able to increase the representation, increase the perspectives that are included in artificial intelligence. Um, and there's a key goal stated in that letter of addressing civil rights concerns around artificial intelligence. Um, so I think we'll have a lot to discuss today, a lot to discuss in the coming weeks, and I'm excited again that you joined us today. I'll kick it over to Hava Omar over at uh, ITIF or the Center for Data Innovation. Thanks, Austin. Um, so I'm Hadan Omar. I'm a policy analyst at the Center for Data Innovation, um, and I'm really glad to be here with Russell uh, Wald, who I'm actually going to let introduce himself next. Hello, I'm Russell Wald. I'm the Director of Policy uh, at Stanford HAI, and um, I'm thrilled to be here and just have a brief conversation about something that's been uh, I've been really passionate about over the last uh, few years, and that's the National Research Cloud, or also better known as the National AI Research Resource. And uh, I'm going to start just a couple of minutes to uh, briefly talk about the genesis of a National Re Research Cloud and how we got here. Uh, I think we will probably refer to it as the NAIR going forward uh, for this discussion, discussion, the federal term that was uh, applied to it. And the concept of the uh, NAIR came from HAI co-directors, John Etchmendy and Faith A. Lee. And uh, essentially they proposed this idea in 2019 uh, and uh, were able to get uh, 22 of the top 30 computer science universities, their presidents and provosts to champion it as well. After which Congress passed the National AI Research Task Force Act, establishing the task force that's currently conducting this study. <clears throat> a final report is due to Congress and uh, the president in the fall of this year. Before I describe the concept of what uh, a proposed NERD would look like, I'm uh, going to note that, uh, why there's a need for one. And John Etchmendy and Faith Ailey were a bit prescient a few years ago when they recognized AI researchers were faced with a growing lack of resources to innovate in this space, mainly a lack of access to compute power and data sets. This has caused a growing focus on the dominant player in AI research industry and the dominance of commercialized AI, and something that Austin essentially referred to just a moment ago. While com commercial industry is crucial, academic uh, research is equally paramount. Long time horizons allow for, uh, allow for the, uh, and no need uh, to res respond to shareholders, allow for this longer term type of research that has a more beneficial social good. This gives you, uh, has given breakthroughs uh, such as GPS, the internet and CRISPR. And we run a risk of losing AI exclusively to the commercial space and industry and th they setting the terms of AI ethics and norms. This is why Etchmendy and Lee proposed the NAIR and essentially what uh, it comes down to is providing academic researchers access to compute power and government data sets to engage in research. And I hope we discuss the, the various possible models that could come from this during this conversation. So shortly after Congress passed the statute for the NAIR, Stanford HAI and Stanford Law School uh, and Stanford Law School brought a team of graduate students from engineering, law, computer science, business, and economics to conduct the most comprehensive study uh, of the NAIR to date. And these just extraordinary students came together and uh, we'll put that in the chat box, make that available for everyone, that, the final report. But what our report did is it validated Etchmendy and Lee's concerns on academia being squeezed out of AI research. And that was essentially our theory of impact and a big part of why we're here today. So of course, in any public policy debate, 
there's always uh, possible pathways forward and not. And so I hope we take a minute to address some, uh, throughout this conversation, some misconceptions and a bit of false narratives about the NARA, what it is ultimately designed to do. And I'm turn it over to hold on and we can have a more uh, wider conversation on this, which I'm very much looking forward to. Thanks, Russell. I, I just want to build a little bit on, on what you said um, about, you know, why exactly we need this resource. You know, last night I, I looked at what the current allocations of the existing national computing resources for AI, um, you know, are being used for. And, you know, just looking at the top 10 that I could find, the first 10, you know, one project team is using um, AI supercomputing to, you know, predict the long-term outcomes of Alzheimer's disease. Um, another team is using AI to improve the data quality of information from a huge telescope in South Africa so that they can understand, you know, the first stars and the first galaxies, you know, 13 billion years ago. Another team is automating, um, you know, the detection of breast cancer. Another team was evaluating the structure of airport pavements. Um, and the first one I came across was uh, using AI to create and classify the largest data set of historic Japanese stamps. And, you know, I give these examples to show just how varied, you know, basic academic research is. Academic research in AI plays a really unique role in kind of providing foundational generic knowledge that, you know, increases the, um, the pool of of knowledge that is available in the public commons. It's not to say that the private sector doesn't do basic research, but not nearly in the same way. I mean, it's much less likely that you're gonna find a private company uh, you know, using an AI supercomputer to classify historic Japanese stamps, right? Um, the type of research that academia does is solving public challenges and it's initiating these you know, socially important innovations in a way that other types of research cannot and will not because they're not incentivized to. But the issue is, you know, for every single one of these, um, you know, research projects that I that I mentioned, and on all of them that that are you're able to find, there are at least two more, if not more, that are not able to be, um, you know, pursued because there just isn't enough resources to go around. And so the NAIR is really about, um, you know, increasing the amount of these. Um, projects that we can support because ultimately, um, you know, academic research is in, you know, it's in the public good. And so that's, you know, from my perspective, that's what really what the NAIR is about. Uh, thank you, Haman. Yeah, which makes me uh, think of kind of another point there, which is you know, you're talking about at least two more projects. You know, I know you did that paper before with uh, CDI talking about how only one third of exceed polls are met. Now that's given the fact that people are actually trying to make those polls. So often I talk to PhD students or other people at universities and ask them, they're like, oh, if only we had the resources, we could do all these things. It's like, okay, well, nice. And they haven't even really even, there's not a laundry list of all the different projects people would want to do beyond this two thirds that you're pointing out because people don't even conceive of the possibility of having them because of the great scarcity and the aggregation in private industry. And again, I think to your point, right, the issue is not so much that private industry is doing so much, it's that the public sector is doing so little comparatively, right? If you look at the NSF, uh, NSF put out their updated graph of R&D spending, you can see the line of public funding go about like this. And the only reason that the United States is competitive with our geopolitical friends on the stage, right, is that the private sector line goes like this, right? And that means that so much of that energy goes towards improving the language models that underlie Facebook and Google, improving the recommender models, right, that underlie the other social media platforms, and improving other business relevant, uh, like near term commercializable products and, and uh, technology. And so looking a little bit ahead of that, you know, what do you see in terms of the potential for a NAIR to either remove some of that public-private split and close the gap or to some of the concerns that it may entrench those companies? I mean, what's your opinion on that? So I guess there's there's kind of two parts of that, that question. The first is it, it's right what you say about this kind of gap um, or the, the balance between, you know, um, the, the kinds of research that we do. If, if it's that the private sector is doing, you know, a significant amount of um, the national AI portfolio in terms of research, um, 
the types of research that we will do will be um, more commercially focused. And like, while there's nothing wrong with having commercially focused AI research, um, for the, the things that are in the public good, things like um, you know, uh, climate change and AI for climate change, that's something that um, companies are not incentivized to do. Um, it's not in their business models to do things that are um, you know, uh, kind of public good. Um, and so that's the reason that we really need to have um, this balance of the national portfolio. Um, and when you kind of talk about this um, entrenching uh, and, and you know, entrenching power towards big tech companies, um, I always think when it comes to charges of kind of monopoly power, the first thing you have to do is kind of identify the relevant market. Um, you know, when it comes to big tech, uh, monopoly power is an oft cited concern, right? Um, but we could be talking about advertising, social networking, um, consumer products, e-commerce. You know, in this case, the market that we're talking about is high performance computing and AI. And when you look at the big tech companies um, that we're discussing, um, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, I actually don't think that they have um, monopoly power in that particular market because they are only providers of cloud computing services. And when we talk about high performance computing, cloud computing is part of it and on-premises systems are part of it. So you've really got to think about, um, you know, server um, servers, that's companies like Cray and Huawei and Fujitsu. Um, you've got to think about storage companies like Dell and HPE and IBM. You've got to think about um, processor companies like NVIDIA and Intel and AMD. They are all part of, um, you know, create of the HPC and AI market. So um, in reality, big tech probably has about a 10% market share of the entire market because they only do cloud computing. Um, but I also, you know, I'd love to hear Russell's thoughts on that question. Yeah, I would probably go back into our academic report and rely on what a lot of entrepreneurial and thoughtful, brilliant students did in this investigation as we were looking at, into this and saying, what is the right model for a NAIR and how would it look like? And when we were initially talking about this and sketching this out, uh, one of my colleagues said, well, you know, this is a whole lot of work. Why, do, why doesn't... Um, the federal government just subsidized cloud computing and call it a day. And as we started digging in a little bit deeper, we actually noticed and realized, and there's this uh, very uh, common thing of, I don't, uh, stereotype of government can't do anything well. Can be true if you've been to a local DMV, but in some things, cases they can do things exceptionally well. And actually on um, computing, uh, aspects of computing, we noticed that it was a seven and a half times cost savings by actually developing uh, HPC type of clusters for this whole uh, project of, of an air. So when there's regular continuous use of this, it's much cheaper to have the government provide this type of uh, funding versus just the subsidization of, the cl uh, of cloud computing credits. Now, the unique thing about this is, is time is of the essence, right? Uh, commercialization of, of AI is happening at a, a rapid uh, pace, and there's not enough, I think, in the academic uh, space to validate uh, um, these issues within AI and to give us these different types of uh, pathways forward. It is possible at the very beginning of this, you would need to rely on commercial cloud computing to be able to get something going until these uh, uh, on-prem systems can be built, built out. Uh, that is a possibility, uh, we, but what we do call for is essentially a hybrid model in our report and in our investigation. And what we say is, is because the cost savings is so substantial, there should be on-prem uh, clusters uh, built throughout the United States and that uh, cl the cloud computing credits should be supplemental to those initially to get things started and as well as of any kind of surge issues or having the, the capacity to meet those types of demands. So it's not as though uh, we're keeping this exclusive to one domain or not. We're trying to open, it. our thoughts are from our research that guides us is to open this up so that it has a government at the table as well as industry in a supplemental aspect there. And that is one of the key issues that we did discuss in the report. Yeah, and so looking at q and I think somebody raises a great point. Uh, Irving raises, if you consider partnering with the national labs, 
And then also depends when I read about Facebook's machine, I checked friends in Argonne and learned that their planned exascale scale machine will be significantly bigger. Ironically, kind of makes the point, right? Well, first of all, the national labs are an incredible computing resource, right? I think they're viewed in a lot of ways as the standard. And I think that the national lab capacity would be ultimately a component of an air in the same way that it contributes to other shared like aggregated computing systems. But the fact that when you check with Argon, their response is ours will be significantly bigger shows you that that's the race, right? At the end of the day, it's like, how big is the next computer? I'm looking at Facebook's machine. It's not like it's built with Facebook processors and Facebook interconnect and Facebook memory, right? It is NVIDIA A100s, right? It is InfiniBand. It is all these other like companies that go into it. And there's nothing that says, no matter how much people con are concerned about the function of government, right? There's nothing that says that building the same system out of the same component parts is somehow more difficult for them in the same way that building those machines for the national labs are not bigger than them. And Irving, if you think national labs like to partner with us even more, please let me know. I'd love to hear it. Now, when we talk about all this big compute, right? A concern that oftentimes comes up is environmental impact. You hear a lot about it in terms of cryptography, which is a similar massive parallel computing effort, right? Um, but looking at the environmental impacts, huh? then you wrote a great uh, paper recently that went through some of these concerns and some potential benefits. I'm sure you've had more time to think about it even since. So do you want to give a little bit of feedback to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, there have been a number of claims about the kind of potential energy and carbon costs of an air, you know, and, and, and you do hear, you know, won't such a large computing resource for AI have massively negative impacts on, you know, the global carbon footprint and, and therefore why would we pursue such a thing? Um, first, I think it's really important to contextualize this concern. Um, my colleagues in the clean energy team at ITIF have written a fantastic report called um, Beyond the Energy Tech Lash that among other things um, explains that information and communication technologies, which importantly includes the data centers that store and process data, um, only accounts for about 1.4% of global carbon emissions. You know, many of the numbers and the apples to oranges comparisons that we hear about IT and computing in general, you know, things like training one natural language processing model is the equivalent of taking 300 flights from New York to San Francisco. You know, those types of things are, you know, often either exaggerated or they are misleading because they're out of context. Um, but, you know, even despite that, you know, the, the most important point is the question shouldn't really be, does a national AI research resource use energy? The question should be, does the energy being consumed involve, um, you know, does it generate net positive societal benefits? And I think without question, if implemented correctly, Anair would do that. It wouldn't only sort of create benefits um, related to broad social goals, like, you know, around um, solving challenges in medicine or, you know, increasing opportunity for groups that are traditionally underrepresented in science and engineering, but it's, you know, for those related specifically to climate change itself, you know, AI, like other digital technologies is, is key to finding solutions that, um, you know, reduce energy demand and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you know, the European Commission itself has said in its um, recent uh, white paper on AI, that AI is a critical enabler for attaining the goals of the Green Deal. And I think the United States should be um, thinking about AI that way too. You know, think about smart grids, think about optimizing traffic, think about climate modeling. You need AI and HPC in order to do that um, as effectively as possible. And I think if we're going to talk about the um, environmental and energy consequences of an air, it's grossly misleading to only talk about the energy costs of actually building and designing this without factoring in all the things that it can allow us to forego. You know, if we were to do that, um, I actually think that the environmental consequences of an air could actually be in favor of it rather than against it. Um, I think a much more pragmatic place um, to have the conversation about the environmental um, you know, consequences is um, how can we build and implement this resource in the most um, efficient way? And that's something that the um, Massachusetts Green um, Regional Computing Center has done. It's a, it's a large computing center um, in Massachusetts that's a kind of collaboration between a number of different um, universities on the East Coast. And it's, it's been awarded the highest level um, for energy and environmental design that the, that the Green Building Council gives. You know, and, and why did they get that? They got that because they did energy modeling when they were designing it. They use efficient voltage power distribution. They use minimal chiller usage. I've actually not really heard much about 
um, how we could do this for the net. That's something that I would like to see investigated. That's something that I would um, really think is a is a really um, important and pragmatic, um, you know, contribution to to um, you know this resource that will be extremely beneficial. And that's where I'd like to see this kind of conversation um, kind of shift towards. I, I want to build on what Hodan talked about real quick and just note that for me through this pursuit of this entire journey of learning about a NAIR and being a, a, a part and applying research methods and learning more about this, that has always been one of my general greatest concerns is what is the environmental impact of, of such a system? Are we creating, you know, by democratizing access, thousands of pollu uh, carbon polluters in this particular case? I will say though that uh, Hodan recently wrote a, a piece that kind of illuminates this. Maybe we can have that put in the chat box, I don't know. But um, that was, from my view, a, a really interesting and illuminating area that kind of did alleviate some of these concerns to an extent. So thank you for writing that. It was really useful because I have always had this semi-significant concern, a fairly significant concern about what the environmental impact is. And I'm glad I thought about it more broadly because of that. It, it's quite useful that a NAIR can be uh, potentially helpful in uh, mitigating climate effects if we if used appropriately and it opens up more research in this space. And one, one final point I'll note too, for example, one key aspect that we talk about and that we, we spent a lot of time talking about compute, but we haven't talked about a lot about, a bit about the data yet, all these richly held data sets by the government. So let's talk about the National Oceanic and, uh, and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. By having access to, for example, their data, we might be able to better predict hurricanes uh, and when they're going to attack, how severe they will be and opening up a whole new area of, re of research uh, and give people in climate science the ability to have much more tools to understand where the climate is going. So it's a pretty significant aspect. And so I hope we don't just stay exclusively on compute, which I think is a big part of this conversation, but data, um, which is the other key ingredient of the NAIR, is a very important part and currently sits locked away in the US federal government, uh, uh, disjointed and not uh, uh, appropriately accessible to academic research. Yeah, and I want to just tag one point on that. I mean, I, I don't know if y'all recall, but back the, you know, three times ago, right, when people were trying to warn about the impacts of climate change, you know, there was a great article back in like 2016 about we're going to get to this point where we need geoengineering, right? We continue to hear that we're past a tipping point of being able to use simple carbon reduction. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I really don't want anybody taking random shots at what geoengineering idea is good. Right? I don't want people pumping clouds into the sky or launching trillions of tiny mirrors into space without us having a really good idea of how that's going to work. Um, and I think the only possible way to address that is with some massive simulation and artificial intelligence. And we don't even have remotely the capacity to do that on a social or on a public level, much less, honestly, I think even a private level. Um, and so there's not really any good chance that there's going to be a public effort or, I mean, that there's going to be a private effort to do so, right? Uh, so we kind of only have one option to address climate change, and that is through these powerful public systems when it comes to the potential of mitigation over the long term in a systemic way. Um, so, you know, another important consideration, I think, is looking at people getting engaged, broadening the perspectives, broadening the participation, right? Now, there's two aspects to this in my view, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on each. The first is, you know, as long as we're focused on this you know, more on like the raw business application. I think that we fall, we have a much greater risk of falling into what uh, Russ, your colleague Eric Brynjolfsson calls the Turing trap, right? Where it's this great push towards continuous automation. Um, and if you look at what is happening, some of the examples that Haven pointed out at the beginning, right? Those are all in this augmentation category. Those are all in this, how do we take information? Not all, but at least the vast majority. How do we take this information? How do we take the data that we have and bring it into a more useful space for humans to work with more in an augmented partnership state? And I think that's what a lot of people are really looking for out of artificial intelligence to be a helpful layer. So it seems as though partnering with less represented communities or partnering with less represented or less resourced academic institutions will lead to a far greater variety of applications like that. So first of all, you know, do you agree with that? Is that, is that, am I making a reasonable assumption there? And second of all, you know, how else would a NAIR be able to serve under certain communities? 
um, and in general increased representation in AI, not only from the perspective of social good, but also for the perspective of making less brittle, more interesting, more sufficient, and more broadly cross-disciplinary technology. Well, okay, I'll take this first. So um, yeah, I, I, I do wholeheartedly believe that. Um, I, I really do. Um, I think that you know, when it comes to increasing participation, there's, there's two things I would, I would say. The first is, you know, what you mentioned earlier about, you know, partnering with national labs and, and that sort of thing. I actually think there's some things that we can learn um, from the way that national labs have, have, have done the allocation process. I think one thing that the NEA could do to actually improve on, upon the existing processes is actually have a, um, have an allocation process where perhaps there is a specific, um, you know, allocation type or allocation process specifically for, you know, individuals at minority serving institutions at um, tribal colleges and universities to ensure that um, we are really targeting um, these, you know, um, the individuals who are underrepresented um, to really be able to pursue the um, AI research and also just kind of get involved in, and, and therefore enjoin in the economic and social benefits that come from um, from innovating as well. Um, so that's one thing. And on, on the other side, I also have been hearing this kind of, um, you know, it's also a sort of criticism um, that that the way that the NAIR is being envisioned kind of, it, it lacks interdisciplinary research or perhaps there is this kind of, um, you know, there isn't enough focus on non-computational, um, non-computationally heavy disciplines, you know, disciplines like law and anthropology and history, which are, you know, you know, good at analyzing and addressing the structural issues around AI. Um, and therefore, you know, rather than spending more money on, you know, quote unquote, narrow AI fields like machine learning and deep learning, uh, what about if we invested in more kind of non-computational non computational approaches to ensure that AI develops in the best way. And I don't disagree that we should have an interdisciplinary approach. I just don't think that means we need to remove focus from the fact that um, within these quote unquote narrow, you know, definitions of AI research, there are extensive knowledge that say, you know, black people at HBCUs have that could make AI better and fairer, or that there are women and, and students at less resourced universities or those in sort of less urban regions that can shed light on analyzing and addressing issues associated with AI. Um, I think an, a NAIR is not about excluding certain disciplines, it's about including, um, you know, all people um, who deserve the chance to, to shape the national AI portfolio and, and also just, um, you know, be included. Uh, I'll briefly add on a couple of points. Uh, so one uh, thing that uh, Hodan is talking about is diversity of people, and I'll come back to that. But I also think that there is, a, a, to expand a bit on the diversity of and the interdisciplinary nature. So, you know, AI is not just about computer science, even though that has been the field of where this has originated. But, you know, within HAI, our mission is, is an interdisciplinary aspect to the technology. So we do want to bring in people from law, from uh, 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 philosophers and ethicists. Uh, you do want to bring in people from economics and across the university. I would hope the same thing could be used for a NAIR of where it's not at some point just exclusively for AI development, but it's also a tool to be able to use AI if you are in a different domain or field outside of computer science. So if you are, um, you need access to certain data sets that are held by the federal government, you can work through that and work through the NAIR for those purposes. That only makes people more fluent in the technology and therefore we can actually hold people accountable. Back to the diversity of people itself, um, I very much agree uh, with the need for, uh, uh, we are woefully as a, a society behind in making sure that there are more different faces at, and people at the table for AI. To me, I think the easiest way to do that is to give people the access and the tools that they will need to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, if we want AI to be a public good, well, the economist, uh, uh, an economist uh, definition of a public good is something that must be a useful product or service that is non-excludable and non-depletable. So that means that if AI is supposed to be a public good, like the internet, like some of these other types of things that I've des described earlier, 
Other people need to be able to have access to it and have a seat at the table. And currently under this current status quo, they do not. And so we need to start looking at other type of alternatives. I think this task force is doing this. I'm very proud of our report that we did because I think that opens up a lot of possibilities and it gives uh, the opportunity for diversity to be at the table. Whereas right now under this current status quo, it's just woefully behind as I noted earlier. And I think to answer Ms. Shirley's question, which I hope you're the Ms. Shirley that I know, that would be really exciting for me. To answer Ms. Shirley's question um, about protective guardrails being instituted before it's opened up, guardrails such as implementing bias, ethical implications, unintended consequences, machine versus humanity, and ensuring tech is used for the common good. Now, I would say that one of the best ways to properly institute such guardrails and test them and refine them and have different iterations of them to work from is by having a representative group involved in creating these systems and determining in what way they are used, right? So there will be a greater knowledge of what possible risks there are. There will be a greater knowledge of what new technologies and applications will be beneficial to different communities. And we will have a much greater focus on, hey, this is gonna disproportionately impact me. This is gonna disproportionately impact my neighbors. This is gonna dis disproportionately impact my friends. So we're gonna focus on it and care about it in a way that may not be obvious to people in the Bay Area. From my view, I think we should try to unshackle stuff from the federal government first uh, versus expanding the scope. I'm all for expanding the scope ultimately of having a larger system of where people are fluent in this technology and can be active participants. But at the same time, I having just conducted the study, I know the legal hurdles and all of the challenges, privacy issues, it's pretty uh, significant. And so, for example, uh, a lot of people talk about right now data cooperations or having, uh, I hear often from uh, international governments, how can we be part of an air? And having done the study, there are too many legal and cultural hurdles and things when it comes to data and how data is treated. Uh, to be able to, uh, I think, effectively get to that. My thoughts are the federal government needs to get its house in order first. Uh, that shouldn't preclude others to have better data regimes, but I think it's incumbent upon the federal government to do this first. This is a bit of a pilot to see whether this is even completely feasible and going from there and then expanding the scope of the NAIR to potentially states that want to participate. And then eventually it would be great if you did have some type of multilateral AI research institute that's noted in the NSCI or other type of uh, 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 central organizations that can be useful to help set the norms and understanding of the technology and expand people's ability to participate. So I think that that's a, a key part. So I wouldn't be 100% at this point, given the date, the analysis we've done, to say we are remotely ready to take it to that expanded level. I'm, I'm quite inclined to agree with Russell. Um, I, I totally agree that I think that we should be starting with unlocking, um, you know, federal level data. Um, and I think it's something that we've been trying to do. You know, it's not like that in itself is an easy task. Um, trying to get, you know, easy access to government data is has been something that, you know, people have been working on for decades. So let's just try and hammer that one out. <laughs> well, I guess that's why I raised this, right? I mean, I, when I was on the Hill like five years ago, we were about five years into this task, right? At like the IT subcommittee of, you know, OGR in the house. And so I, I guess I'll make this one plea since we do have to keep focusing on the federal government. If anybody listening <laughs> is from a state or part of a university system, where you have a lot of data that you're trying to figure out what to use, please start getting it together and let me or others know, and we'll try to figure out how to make it useful. Because I think that that inclusion is important. But to your point, don't let me get us distracted. Um, so another question that was raised that I think was good is from I believe Alistair, even though that name's going to cut off, uh, I, who has not read the NAIR proposal, but you still raise a good question. The issue of expertise and talent hasn't been mentioned so far. Even many researchers working on basic research are drawn off into corporates for obvious reasons. Are there any thoughts on this issue? And I have some, but I'll turn it to our actual panels first. So, so on this point, I, I, I think I also saw that question um, about you know expertise and talent, right? So. I think one of the things that we really need to prioritize when it comes to the NET is, um, you know, 
as we've discussed, there's going to be a lot of different parts to it. And it's going to be, you know, quite confusing for the end user to be able to figure out what part of this will be best for me. If I'm trying to do, let's say, a project related to, um, you know, text to speech, um, what should I be using the cloud? Should I be using one of these on-premises systems? Um, who can help me? I think in order to actually make this usable, um, we need to be focusing on kind of service oriented architecture so that um, ultimately from an end user's perspective, they can come in and it can kind of very easily be directed to the parts of the NAIR that will be the best use for them. And it's also best for the taxpayer because um, we need this thing to be as efficient as possible, right? We want it to be both as energy efficient as possible, as cost efficient as possible. Um, so we don't want to be giving, um, you know, a user who could be, um, you know, who would be best suited to the cloud um, using some on-premises system and, and wasting time, wasting energy. Um, so I think when it comes to um, expertise, it's, we should expect that, um, that, a good portion of these users will not, um, you know, have great experience with, you know, exactly how to navigate um, a huge, um, you know, AI research resource and, and how best to, to kind of support that is, is something that really needs to be prioritized, I think. I went back and looked at Alistair's question too, and I think that there was this mention of corporate and the at the talent pool essentially and how a lot of people in uh, probably academia or researchers go into the corporate environment and there are a few reasons for this and you know I want to address uh, as noted the infrastructure issues they don't have the tools in the academic world to be able to do the things that they would want to do so they're compelled to go into the corporate world we hope to correct that with an error um, but the other part of it is is people often say salaries salaries you know they're just uh, th these wonderful salary packages uh, uh, to, to work with in, in big tech. But I have found a lot of people forego those options often for the mission to do something that they want. So to do the type of research they would want to do um, or to go so far as to say as um, that there's a mission, a unique mission that they have that they uh, would like to um, uh, uh, pursue. People go into government for less pay people become teachers for less pay people there's a whole focus of people who do things that aren't salary dependent and you know they're generally uh, some people are blessed to have that opportunity some people make adjustments in their lives but the idea that salary is the only motivating factor here is not always necessarily the case and i think but the biggest thing is, is you have to give people the tools to participate in this field and that is something that should be non-negotiable yeah, and I would just a quick learning from NVIDIA. Um, there is certainly something true to be said about the gravity well of data and compute, right? I think you raise a good point, Russ, of people wanting to do their work. I mean, I am far less of a true like nerd and expert in any way than the actual AI researchers that I was around. But even given that fact, my level of passion, I left a much, much happier financial situation to come and do what I would consider to be my work. And I know that they, on many conversations, if there was the ability to to do the work that they would like to do in the public sector, there would be a lot more people that didn't get pulled out of their actual research institutions. I mean, if you look at Uber hiring pretty much the entire robotics department of CMU, I guarantee you that all those people didn't want new cars, right? They wanted the ability to work on true self-driving technology, right? Um, now at the same time, to the point, some people have kids they'd like to, you know, buy nice stuff for, they, you know, they have things they'd like to do or they have colleges they'd like to fund. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. And I think there's a good point to be made that whatever we are compensating people in the public sector, there should be some, you know, some acknowledgement of that if the gravity data uh, or if the data compute gravity well isn't, you know, completely sufficient in addressing it. Um, sorry, let me go down, I get another question. Uh, I totally forgot. All right, well, we'll move on to the next question we have here, which is how to join NAIR forces with EU academia and politics, including the GDPR, the A Act, the AI Act, and the Digital Services Market Act. How do you believe that our considerations around building a national AI research resource, some of the work that could be done on it, how do you believe that those things are related to those larger efforts? Well, um, that's pretty a, a broad question, a little tough to answer. So I, I, I'd like to know more about where that 
questions for him. But what I will say is at least coming back again to our report, because it's the one thing that I know and I can always just come back to, is we did have a chapter dedicated to ethics review and what would be part of that. And I know the EU has been uh, uh, very aggressively looking at the types of uh, algorithmic accountability that can be applied in this case. And we uh, very much are a call for that too in a, a specific chapter um, on this. This is a very tough politically charged area of where, you know, unfettered, no regulatory aspects to, so for growth to see where things go to, you know, putting on rightful guardrails that are clearly needed in this space and trying to find that sweet spot's really important. So we knew that we needed to address this key issue. And there are a few things that we called for. First, where uh, misuse is obvious uh, and inappropriate, like uh, uh, they should be removed from the air and not have any access to this. Um, there should be a governing body that can, uh, you know, look at particular things that are not just exclusively within government. You want to be careful. You don't want a um, uh, uh, an administration that puts someone into something and then it becomes fully government review of this uh, that uh, might not play by the rules per se. Um, so you want to be really careful about that. So you want academics and people who are, have demonstrated uh, value of the, the, the value of the ethics applied here and you want them at, at the table to help uh, guide this whole process. So I think that's a key part uh, to this is that it shouldn't be, we've set up an infrastructure, help yourselves. We've set up an infrastructure, let's make sure that we apply these guardrails and that they're a part of the process and that uh, it, it actually becomes a routine and routinized uh, for people to understand that more than just help themselves to a bunch of data and build what they, they want. I think just to add to that, I've, I've personally had a lot of um, kind of international um, interest, you know, lots of policymakers in other parts of the world asking, you know, what is this NAIR? What's going on with it? What is the United States? What can we learn from this initiative? Um, I also, you know, think it's such an ambitious, um, you know, initiative. Um, I do think, you know, to the question of, you know, how can we join forces around academia and politics? Um, there might be some specific use cases where it makes sense um, for international collaboration. And I know the task force has been thinking about this. You know, if we are doing AI research specifically around Alzheimer's, are there certain data sets that we could be sharing? Is there, um, you know, very specific use cases given that AI is this dual use technology and also these kind of data security and data privacy considerations, where are the um, kind of um, collaborative areas where it's, um, makes the most sense and it would be um, net positive for us to, to do work together. I think it's about identifying where those um, kind of, you know, those, um, those areas are and, and kind of figuring out what we need to do to, to, to kind of collaborate with our international you know, peers. Yeah, I'll make one closing thought on that, which is, you know, a lot of the issues that we're trying to address or that the EU is trying to address or the United States may be trying to address in, in similar efforts are based upon ambiguous information or based upon ambiguous goals or based upon things that are either future looking or they're working within models that may not currently be functional, especially given the fact that AI research and the state of the rate of AI technology change is faster than at least to my knowledge and what I've heard from others, pretty much any other technology. Like if you watch these research papers come out, if you watch these models evolve, it's almost as though it's a shortening, it's a shortening window. It's like, you know, GPT-2 coming out takes forever. The evolution of GPT-3 is still a couple of years out from that. And then all of a sudden it's like, Google has a multimodal fit. GPT-3 is advanced. There's like three other huge language models that are coming out. Like, I don't think anyone can really underestimate the incredible rapidity of AI research and evolution. And so as these different public entities start trying to regulate, if you don't have environments in which you can actually understand what's happening with the technology in a flexible and ongoing way, I think you may find yourself accidentally doing something that you don't understand or don't mean to do. And that's in no way to criticize the government or the public sector itself. It's to say that me, my job is to read about this stuff pretty much all day. And I definitely barely have an idea of what's going on, right? And I think the same thing applies to, to pretty much the panelists, except for 
well, except for those two, everybody else on the call, except for these two. Um, so I think it's a powerful tool there, but I'll move to one. We have Major Nelson here and all of our participants are great. I'm loving it. Major Nelson is here. He's saying that, you know, you keep saying the government is not trying to get it a collaborative a AI ML. And then he puts down some of the efforts at CISA. Now I'll briefly hit this, which is to say, I don't think anybody here would say that the government's not trying to do it. I think that perhaps the point is that the scale at which it's being done is an order of magnitude lower than it should be, right? Or at least geometric, you know? Um, but I'll turn that over to Hadden and Russ. Sorry, I'll read this to you. Well, I keep saying it's not, here's the CISA cybersecurity division, cybersecurity yeah, it's, lab. It's cyber a very cybersecurity aspect, but you know, I, we need to clarify the government doing AI versus the government supporting infrastructure for people to do AI. And I think that the, those are two different concepts. There's the government that is uh, applying AI techniques in terms of uh, 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 actual administration. So one of my colleagues, Dan Ho uh, and David Engstrom and a few other co-authors, uh, Tina Cuellar, um, did a, a unique report uh, in 2020 called Government by Algorithm. And essentially it was a, just a survey of the US federal government's use of uh, AI and what that meant. Um, I'm sure many people saw the controversy recently of uh, the IRS of all organizations wanting to use facial recognition. I think uh, Joy Bualamini put out a unique piece on the Atlantic, which I encourage people to read. Um, but there's that aspect of it. I think what we are talking about more so here, and it's not so much that the government couldn't probably use the NARA itself. We talked about that a little bit elsewhere but more the government providing an infrastructure for people to use because we have essentially what could be argued is a market failure here of the inability for people to participate in AI uh, in this space. So I think that there's just two different distinctions here. And I think for the purposes of this conversation, we're focusing on the latter of what I just mentioned, the infrastructure key piece. Okay, um, so we're getting pretty close to time. I don't know if we want to get one more question, and if rather than Russ, you want to make a couple minutes of closing remarks before I close it out. I would just like to say, there's a lot of out there that's talking about the myth of AI and what AI will actually be able to do, and I very much understand that and agree with that. There is a whole lot out there that is snake oil. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that are happening that are just phenomenal and unbelievable. And it can really only happen in the academic space. Differential equations, one of the hardest problem, math problems to be solved, right, uh, 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 is being now, AIs close that gap in, in the speed of uh, uh, what comes from that. I am most excited, not about the snake oil that we hear in a lot of these type of commercial products, but instead of what could potentially come from academia of expanding existing sciences and the breakthroughs that can come from that and what it can mean overall. I'm also excited about it for healthcare purposes under the right regulation and being thoughtful what it means for patient care, but it can make a difference in the health of people's lives and we should recognize that. So there's two real strong things that can come from this. And it really can come from academia more than it can come from a commercial base. And to be able to do that, we've got to provide uh, the infrastructure and resources of compute and data. So we have diversity in the field and people are more actively par active participants in that. I would second um, what Russell's just said. And um, I would just say, as we continue to have these kind of conversations and debates around, um, you know, the NAIR generally, I think that we really have to, um, you know, not take criticisms in isolation, but really um, flesh out both criticisms and hear them out, um, but also be willing to hear the other side and really, you know, balance these out. I think that there are a lot of, um, the more diverse perspectives we have, the better. The more comments we have, the better. The better this um, entire Nair will be. And let's just remember, we are at the very beginning of it. We are developing it. It's not something that exists already. Um, you know, we can choose how we want to shape this. Um, I just think that um, we need to um, really deal in pragmatic kind of, um, take a really pragmatic approach to, to 
to it to it all. And so I think that would be my main kind of um, hope and desire for 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 conversations moving forward. But I think this has been a great one. So um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for allowing me to moderate. Uh, makes me feel special to moderate the two of you always. But I just want to say, look, I appreciate to see such a great group uh, tuning in, asking questions, a lot of participants. I think there's a lot of interest in this and for good reasons. And to tag on to what Hagen said, you know, I think the three of us and others that we know that are working on this are in good faith simply trying to figure out the most efficient and reasonable way to create such a program. Because unlike many other technologies, AI is uniquely like scarcity and precursor based in the sense that if you don't have compute and if you don't have data and if you don't have the people to help you string it together, then you simply can't create artificial intelligence. Um, and so, you know, looking at some of the final questions in here about where would the NAIR be housed, right? What is the, you know, how should the states have a role? Now, we may have different perspectives on that, but no matter what, making sure that the different, that states that are currently underserved, EPSCOR, EPSCOR states, uh, making sure that communities that are currently underserved have the, have the ability to access those scarce precursors and have access to the expertise to help them use those in their own environments is critically important. So on that, I encourage you to reach out to me um, and the other, you know, other panelists. I'll put my email in the chat for one last second before it disappears. So if you really want to get in there, I would love to hear from you. Um, but besides that, on behalf of Stanford HAI, Seed AI, and the Center for Data Innovation, um, and my colleagues, Hadan Omar and Russell Wald, thanks for being here today. Uh, we hope you'll remain engaged and supportive of the NAIR. And again, we all hope to hear from you because it's a critical, critically important task that we'd all like to do pretty much the best possible degree that we can. So thank you so much. Have a great day.